mentioned Stamets as a psychonaut and you mentioned the Silk Road. Um, what are the overlaps that you perceive between Bitcoin and psychedelics? Good question, Ricardo. Uh, many. Um, let's see, I'll ramble through a few. So number one, I just for some uh, very scientific data, I tweeted out like a year ago saying, hey, Bitcoiners, um, are you supportive of, of psychedelics? Yes or no? Some, some poll like that. And it was like 79% of people who responded to my poll said that they support psychedelics. And so I think probably in, it's probably like three to five times more than the national average in the US, just to give rough estimate, which would indicate that Bitcoiners are very open-minded to psychedelics compared to normal people. Unsurprising. Um, okay, what do psychedelics do? Or why would someone be drawn to them? Number one, culture says they're bad. So you have to be kind of disagreeable with culture in order to say yes to psychedelics, just like you have to be disagreeable to say yes to Bitcoin, especially in the early day. So disagreeableness seems there, seems obvious. Um, they also deal with um, opening your mind. And, and I don't mean that in like a woo-woo way. I mean that like literally trait openness, which is one of the big five uh, personality traits from psychology is openness. Um, and we can demonstrate now in a lab showing that people who, who use psychedelics increase trait openness, so they're more open-minded. And I think that also correlates with Bitcoin because in order to grasp what this thing is, um, you have to kind of throw away your preconceived notions of what money is. And you have to humble yourself and realize that it's, it's a hard, harsh process to learn and unlearn all these things in order to accept Bitcoin. And so I think those are two right off the top. Right off the top. Um, I think there's something else about like, how can I say this? Like psychedelics are something that make you a better person and they allow you to find rock bottom truth in the world. And yes, it could be a party drug and all this other nonsense. But at the core, what they do is they strip away cultural programming. You go to the rock bottom of who you are and you have an ability to be a better person. And I think the type of people who pursue psychedelics are seeking truth. Uh, many of them are, myself included. And I think that's the same with Bitcoin. It's like once you get a taste of truth or inching closer to truth, you want more of it. And, and so I think what you see with Bitcoiners is that if you find Bitcoin, you realize uh, on the path to understanding Bitcoin, you realize that the government's perspective on money is not the whole story. And if that's true, uh, we've been lied to, quote unquote, our whole lives about money, then what else might not be true? What else are we lied about? Right. So it leads to this, this series of asking questions. And so uh, to summarize, it both self-selects. Uh, Bitcoin self-selects for people who are open-minded and people who take psychedelics are more inclined to find Bitcoin. So it's both. And one last little nugget here that's kind of fun is that a extremely high percentage of high profile Bitcoiners, people you guys know by first name, have privately and publicly told me that they're supportive or they've consumed psychedelics and it has positively impacted their life and positively impacted their perspective on Bitcoin. Um, like I learned a lot about Bitcoin while tripping. Like that is a very common uh, response. And most Bitcoiners are shy about it because whatever, there's still some cultural baggage that comes along with it. But I encourage people to come out of the psychedelic closet. It's changing fast. And the more healthy, good, normal people being pro-psychedelics, uh, I think that's better. It will move the needle from there. Just like being open about Bitcoin. You need the NIMS, but you also need the public people putting their reputation on the line saying, I'm a normal person. I support Bitcoin. I support psychedelics, and so should you. There's a, there's a lot of uh, nuggets there, like uh, <laughs> quite a few things that I can I can think of to to ask you or talk about. I guess like um, as you say, uh, I kind of see actually the 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 people I've met in in person in my life or stumbled upon in person who are into Bitcoin were also into psychedelics quite a lot and spoke about how it changed their points of view. Something I've never tried myself, but would probably be open to in the future. But um. But yeah, I, I think that like one of the things you draw on um, a little bit as well, uh, which I, I, I guess I find quite interesting is like how essentially, you know, the, the, the swap from the current fiat system to Bitcoin system and obviously as well trying to get rid of what you understand or we understand money is right now. And I think something that's weird to me is I was thinking literally this earlier today was that if you went up to someone 
from like 1840 or something. And, and if you can get past the hurdle of explaining the technology, right, of like Bitcoin, the internet, that bit, right, if you can somehow just give them that knowledge, they would be so much more accepting probably of Bitcoin than probably anyone in the last century immediately off the bat, I would have thought, because they're like, well, yeah, okay, it's limited. It's like, uh, there's a limited supply. It's something that like is essentially sound, it's sound money, like like gold would be, for example. So I'm thinking like, it, it's kind of something we've been trained with the whole sort of Keynesian approach of the last hundred years, maybe, to kind of think in this wrong manner. So it's almost like you've got to untrain. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I feel like we always think of history in, in such like a short view, like over oh, the last 20 years or whatever, but actually look at the last, 20,000 years, probably our forefathers would have understood it a lot better than, than we do uh, immediately when you start teaching us about it. 100%. I think it depends where in history you go, right? I think your last point about the forefathers, I think that's the most important point. Um, but before we go there, I guess when I look throughout monetary history, I see periods of hard money, I see periods of soft money, right? And so it kind of flows in and out. And most people, um, how would I say this? Like, we have a recency bias and the lesson of history is that we don't learn from history. And so we all kind of feel like we're in our tight little band, we're all fish swimming in the water and we don't know we're wet, right? And so depending on where you look, if you're on the back end of a hyperinflation event, it's extremely obvious why you need Bitcoin. But if you're in the middle of the, um, the Roman empire's growth period, primarily built on sound money and, and trade and, and accounting, um, you wouldn't even know you needed it, right? You would probably take for granted the fact that the money was important. And so I kind of go back and forth with your point, but I guess I want to zero in on our founding fathers. And I'm from America. We have people from all over the world in this call. So it's not relevant exactly to everyone. However, the ideas of America, um, property rights, separation of church and state, federalism, right? Distri distributing power. These type of ideals are very powerful. They're very, very aligned with Bitcoin. And so our founding fathers absolutely would have understood the value of Bitcoin. And it's really sad when you see, we'll say the, the, politi the populist political left in the United States, which finds socialism uh, popular. We call each other, we, um, this group calls each other comrade unironically. And again, back to the point of they don't know uh, how important sound money is because they were given everything and they're wondering why it's not going well. And so, yeah, it's, a, it's honestly a very frustrating point watching young people uh, choose, think that social, social, socialism is the, the problem here, or sorry, is the solution here. But to empathize with that group a little bit, they, they see a world with no hope. They don't trust the politicians, they have no money, they can't save, they can't get ahead. And so the average young person today feels left out and they feel screwed. And rightfully so, they, they legitimately are. Um, but sadly, it's not as easy as just saying, well, capitalism is the enemy, we just have to give socialism, right? And so the political narrative is rich people are evil, so we need to steal their money and give it to the to poor people and then everything will be fine. Right. And that totally betrays economic reality. And so I'm a little bit scared of the populist left, predominantly young people trying to attack free markets, trying to attack Bitcoin, trying to attack what we call capitalism, um, because that's you diagnose the problem. Right. But the solution is incorrect. And so I would love to see a. Um, I don't know, capture the hearts and minds of young people more because they are the future and they're the ones who need hope. And the reality is that Bitcoin fits into their worldview a lot more than they think it does. But I think that mainstream narrative around Bitcoin is more like a libertarian wet dream than it is like, hey, this is honest money. This is the, the most fair system we can possibly create, right? And it's, it's just about framing, but um, I'd like to see the young people on board quicker, but I think they need it. Well, something that uh, I, I don't know, did you watch the um, the B Word conference? Uh, very top, actually. Uh, it only happened yesterday as of the time of recording. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I I saw um, a bit of it live, honestly got bored, and then I watched a highlight later on, um, just of like different bits. The only thing that I actually did find really a good point, actually, from Elon Musk, some I'm not massively a fan of by any means, but. Um, 
the, a good point that he made was when someone was, uh, I can't remember who, who set this up and I can't remember if it's the right quote, but he basically said that, uh, well, it's like, if you don't like business, government essentially is the business at the very worst and the very largest and they essentially it uses violence. And so I, and I found that was like a pretty good point because like, if you look at Bitcoin specifically as well, right, you've got this kind of sound, fair hard money, essentially. And, and, and if you look at so the government as the largest business and you look at things like Amazon and Apple and all these large corporations underneath it, it's kind of like the government obviously benefits the most from the current fiat system. And then the large companies beneath them benefit a hell of a lot as well. And that just essentially just cascades down so that small businesses and really, really local people with their one sort of mom and pop store size coffee shop or whatever get completely screwed. And, and what I feel like with, with Bitcoin is it's almost like uh, it's kind of giving people a chance, right? Like if you have this little mom and pop store, if you accept Bitcoin, if you try and like, just try and do something different to bring in customers. And then you, you can essentially, the more of you who do that, it's kind of like a vote against like these large corporations and the large government and the financial system that they're using that isn't working essentially. So it's kind of like, um, kind of what I guess what I'm trying to get is like, it kind of works for business as well as just individuals. Like if you're for small businesses, like Bitcoin is almost like to me anyway, I feel like kind of a savior. Uh, and if, if someone out there can, you know, develop like an application or, something that can kind of empower small businesses to start accepting Bitcoin and bring in a ton of users that way, then onto, onto something pretty good. Yeah, I agree. And I think your point there is, is very, very important, right? Uh, I think Elon's quote was like, if you don't like big corporations, you should hate the government even more or something like that. And that's a really, really, really quote based perspective from Elon Musk. And I guess my takeaway from the conference or from that specific talk was that Elon is going slow, uh, step by step, he's learning. He still doesn't know very much. Like I know 19 year olds in Nigeria that could school him on all things Bitcoin. So he's got a lot, a lot, a lot of room to grow there. Um, but he did say a lot of base things. And I think, I think he's inching in Bitcoin's direction. I don't want to support him, but I think generally speaking, the message is going to be positive coming out of that conference to the, the broader audience that may have listened to that. Um, and with regards to the current system and how uh, corporations, politicians, the whatever, they have more benefits than the little guy. That's true, right? It, it was called the Cantillon effect from an economist who recognized the closer you are to the money printer, the more benefits you have. And that's absolutely true. We essentially have a system where the source of the money printer is so powerful that incentivizes anyone who can get close to it to do so. So that's corporations, that's literally the government, right? The government can print money or they can tax you. Those are the two forms of revenue. Nobody likes taxes. So if you're gonna take my money out of my paycheck, you better give me a good reason to say yes to that, right? So it's actually an honest trade saying here's your, your tax, your tax bill is what we're going to give you for it. Um, whereas inflation is like a shadow tax. They can print as much as they want, do whatever they want with it. And it's not immediately obvious to normal people that they're stealing from you. Um, and so it's kind of a shadow tax or an overt thing. And that sucks, right? And so the incentives there are to politicize the money. And that leaves the people who don't have political capital left out in the dark. And that's why you see the large businesses going to government and changing the rules to prevent the little startups from being able to compete, right? The regulatory capture anymore. And so all these incentives just build a structure that steals from the little guy and puts it at the top of the pyramid over and over and over again. And Bitcoin threatens that game. And if Bitcoin is successful, and I would argue it's on its way, um, it's going to depoliticize the money. It's going to change the incentives completely because if you can't change the system, if you don't get unfair rules in Bitcoin, right? Nobody has unfair rules in Bitcoin. Everyone's treated the same. If that's true, then the incentive is not to attack the money. The incentive is to actually create value. And how different of a world would it be if politicians are only able to raise funds through taxes and corporations only make money by creating value, right? Like that's a much more, much more, um, that's a better world, right? At least everyone has a chance. And if we go global for a second, I have a tendency to think in my own backyard 
um, more than global, right? I live in America and this is the water I, I, I'm in, whatever. Uh, but the reality is that I benefit more from the Cantillon effect than someone from El Salvador, for example, right? I can get a stimulus check. People in El Salvador, we're just exporting our inflation to them and they get no benefit from it. And simultaneously, it's very expensive under our current banking system to bank the bottom third of our planet, right? We have we have these rules like KYC and you have to have an address and do all these things. And so the bottom third of our planet can't get bank accounts. So zero access to financial services. And in a modern global digital world, we're essentially one third of the human capital can't compete in the marketplace. So not only is that a humanitarian nightmare, but it's also bad for the, the whole population, right? I believe that markets uh, surface the best ideas and a good idea, uh, let's say a mobile phone, starts off expensive for the wealthy and then it becomes something for the whole world, right? And so we want everyone we can possibly get competing in the market to bring their ideas to market because the few ideas that are really good and they become commercialized help everyone. And so Bitcoin not only onboards human capital and it's good for, for uh, those individuals, but it's actually good for our species. And so I see Bitcoin as a, a, an imperative um, in modern times. And speaking the same economic language, to use a metaphor, um, honestly, I, I, it's hard for me to comprehend how much value will unlock, right? How many... How many Leonardo da Vinci's, how many Maya Angelos, how many insert famous inventor creator are hiding in countries right now and they can't get their ideas off the ground. They can't save, they can't get ahead. They're, they're farming and they're just trying to get by because they, don't have, they can't get a loan to start a business. So they can't form capital to start their business, right? Um, it's tragic, honestly. And so <laughs> we gotta make this thing work. Brandon. One of the most discussed was your idea of Bitcoin and the fourth turning. Would you mind kind of giving us a summary of what that is? Yeah, totally. So there's, everyone knows the sovereign individual, um, a book kind of looking at mega trends throughout history. It's a very common Bitcoin book. It sort of predicted, um, it predicted Bitcoin and predicted like fracturing of city states, all these things. Um, and I bring it up because it was written in the same year as the fourth turning. So it's a late nineties book written by demographers, and it similarly is prophetic and, and looking to the future, and it seems to be getting a lot of things right. What they're looking at here is that site, human, human time, uh, we view as a linear thing, right? Uh, left to right, A to B, month to month, year to year, whatever. Um, however, they look, at, they look at time in a more cyclical fashion, which is um, how ancient man used to look at time. And what they're finding is that if you look at dem demographics, so you're looking at people and demographic cohorts and how those demographics uh, move through time, what they're finding is that patterns start to emerge, okay? And the primary pattern that they see is a roughly an 80 to 90 year cycle, which they call a saculum, which is essentially a long human life. And in that 80 to 90 year cycle, they go through four stages, first, second, third, fourth turnings. Each cycle, each part of the cycle is called a turning. Uh, spring, summer, winter, fall, or however you want to look at it. And at the end of that cycle, we have this external world crisis. So think like we, we build all these institutions like government, politics, and business, and schools, and whatever. And at the end of the cycle, we essentially outgrow those institutions and they start to decay for whatever reason. And we realize, wow, our institutions suck. It's time to destroy them and start over. Uh, and so they, they observe this cycle and we're at right now, we're like right in the middle of the fourth turning. And to go back in history a little bit, this current fourth turning started uh, right after World War II, or sorry, this, this cycle started after World War II. So around like 1945, 1946. And so, the previous fourth turning was 1929 to 1945. Okay, that's the stock market crash. That's the Great Depression. That's World War II. That's uh, Keynesianism, where we started to monetize the debt. That's where we invented the World Bank, IMF, uh, Social Security, all kinds of crazy things changed in that period. And so there's a fourth turning. And then we go into Pax Americana, 1945 to like the mid 60s. That's when 
typical first turning. Everyone's sick of fighting. And it's just like cooperation. Culture is boring. It's sterile. Um, things are pretty good, right? And then you have the cultural revolution, the second turning. That's when all the kids who grew up in this leave it to beaver, white picket fence, sterile, boring world, they grow up and they go, screw that. Where's the music? Where's the edge? Where's the sex, drugs, and rock and roll? That's the second turning. That's a culture revolution. That's an internal revolution where the oppressed, boring kids rebel against their parents and they get civil rights movements, you get the psychedelic 60s, et cetera. And then that transitions into a third turning. That's 80s and 90s. Uh, the parallel here would be like the 1920s, uh, the flappers, the, it's, it's just like deregulation, um, culture is successful, and we start just partying and like it's something feels off, but nobody cares. It's like we're getting so good, so let's get drunk before the, the, the booze runs out. Um, and then you have 08, right? And that's the transition to the fourth turning. So that'd be like 2000, uh, 1929 and 08. 2008 are kind of the same time period. And what that is, is the recognition that our institutions are failing and that we actually need our institutions. And so that would be, okay, aftermath of the great financial crisis, you look around and you say, okay, the financial system is broken. Uh, it'd be really good if that was working. Oh, weird, the media can't be trusted. Okay, healthcare is garbage in the United States in most places. You know, the, the politics isn't working for people. And you start to see our entire exterior world is not working and the people are revolting against it. And so what happens is in fourth turnings, the people collectivize and they decide it's time to make a change. And sometimes that goes really dark. Like in the 30s, there was a lot of talk of communism and collectivism. Marginal tax rates got up like 79% or something like that. And essentially it's humanity's response to a huge problem the response is to collectivize and work together. And so that's what's happening right now. I would argue that things like cancel culture, that would be a symptom of the humanity's collective understanding that shit's messed up and we need to figure it out. And the response is, if you're not with us, you're against us. So it creates this rigid cultural lines. And if you're outside the circle, you get canceled. Um, and that's kind of where we are right now. And the tricky part here is, I would say we have somewhere between five to 10 years left of this fourth turning. And every fourth turning has a climax period. That would be World War II uh, previously. And all previous fourth turnings in the United States have been war. So World War II, the American Revolution, or sorry, the Civil War, and then the American Revolution going back. And so the, the previous three fourth turnings have been war. Uh, the question is, what will our conflict be for this fourth turning? I really hope. It's not total war. Um, it could be. It could be COVID. It could be American Civil War. It could be something else. I don't know. But my feeling is that we haven't reached the, the peak of the climax yet. And so I'm looking to the future. Um, I see risk on the horizon. So in my personal life, I'm trying to think about ways to prevent catastrophic risk, right? Own some Bitcoin, get a second passport, have a backup plan have a side hustle, whatever the things are that you can do in your life to, to decrease the risk of ruin, I think makes sense in a period of high volatility. The last thing I'll say is that if this thesis feels weird, whatever, like read the first like 10 minutes of the article I wrote, it explains the thesis a little bit more in depth. But the thing that really made sense to me was there's a symbiosis between the context upon which we live, so our environment, and how we respond to it. So for example, the millennial generation, we're all born at the same time period, roughly. So if you're born in the same context, the culture around you shapes everyone the same, right? It doesn't mean we're all equal, we're all whatever, but we all have the same influences. So generally speaking, the millennial generation who grew up in a set period of time is more alike than let's say the Gen Xers who grew up in an entirely different cultural context, right? So culture influences the generation then that generation, which is relatively well-defined, grows up. Again, they're all similar. And then they start pushing back on culture. And then that culture produces the next generation. And then they grow up and then they start influencing culture. So it's a symbiotic relationship between culture and generations. And that is the fundamental building block of these cycles. 
then you layer on the fact that humans act in a predictable way. Young people grow up and they rebel against their parents. Middle-aged people, they start families. They become more conservative. They take less risk. Older people act a certain way, right? So stages of life matter. And so it sounds like horoscopes for uh, intellectuals. However, I think it, I think there's truth here, which is that this base emergent human thing, like we think we're these rational monkeys or whatever, but we act so predictably irrational. Thank you.